So Romans chapter 8 and verse 12 to verse 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Um, As John says, we've come uh, to this wonderful chapter of, of Romans 8, and we said two weeks ago now that the big overriding theme of the chapter as a whole is assurance. Um, as again, as uh, John mentioned, the end of chapter seven left Paul reflecting on, on his, his fight within himself uh, to, to sort of want to, to follow God and know God and walk in God's ways, but that sort of battle that he experiences that led to that kind of, what a wretched man am I, but thanks be to God um, for Jesus. So we've, we've sort of come uh, through chapter six and seven, which are focused a lot on the, the kind of ongoing battle that we have as Christians with, with sin within. And then we come to this chapter 8, which, as we, as we said, is, is just run through from beginning to end uh, with assurance for the Christian who, who's in the fight. And we said two weeks ago that there are two great challenges to our assurance as Christians. There is that ongoing battle with sin, um, and there is also the issue of suffering um, and, and how we think about suffering, how we experience suffering. Um, it, it can rock our assurance, it can rock our faith and our confidence. And, and chapter 8 split into these two sections that look at these two challenges, um, sin being the focus of verses 1 to 17, and then you'll notice the word suffering is mentioned in verse 17, and that then leads us into the second uh, section of the chapter, which looks at our assurance, even in the midst of great suffering. Um, and also, just as a final sort of introductory comment, the, 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 particularly this first half of the chapter is, is sort of hugely um, emphasising the work of God's Holy Spirit in us, uh, through us, again, in all the ways that are in the boxes on the wall behind me. And, and Paul is, is working that through to show us what's happening and to assure us that we are God's children, even in the midst of, of this sort of threat, if you like, of sin, the Spirit liberating us from sin and death, uniting us to Jesus, governing the mind of the believer and leading us in the ways that we should go. This spirit who indwells us is the spirit of God, is the spirit of Christ. Essentially, Christ is in us because his spirit is in us and the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is also living in us. And it was really the bottom sort of right or the bottom two boxes over on that side that got me thinking that it might be just useful to to do another diagram, which we'll get to in a second, Um, just to sort of root us again in terms of what's going on in Romans 8 and and why Paul is addressing the things that he's addressing. In verse 10, in that middle box at the bottom, Paul speaks about the fact that because the Spirit is in us, we are now spiritually alive. We're we're in relationship with God. We were spiritually dead, um, and there was a first aid course here yesterday, and I wonder if this was mentioned, that actually when we as people are lying on the ground, if you like, before God, spiritually dead, there is no spiritual life in us. That's our natural state. But verse 10 says that the Spirit has come into us, indwells us, and has made us spiritually alive. Better than CPR. We are now alive to God, not dead to God. And yet, and that's true, even though, verse says, we, we are living in a decaying body, this body of death, a, a, a body that will decay, a body that will suffer, a body that will get ill, a body that will die. So you've got that dual thing going on. We still occupy this body of death, and yet spiritually we're alive. And that's where then verse 11 comes in and says, but actually the spirit that's in you is the same spirit that raised Jesus's dead body from the grave and brought him to life, and that promise holds for you too. So we're almost in a place of death and life now, Body of death, but spiritually alive, and yet life is ahead, even for our bodies that will be raised. 
And that led me into this thinking that we're living in this kind of dual situation as Christians. And then I started to think, well, actually, we see that all over Romans. So I took my technolo technological know-how and pulled this next slide together to try to give you a bit of an insight as to what's going on. I'll let you just scan that for a second. Thank you very much. <laughs> and just sort of scan all the way around that. And then let me just sort of remind you that, that, that actually in Romans, this picture has very much been building. And where we are in Romans 8, particularly, and, and it's been coming in, in sort of 6, 7, and now in 8, is, is very much focusing on life in the shaded area. So the early chapters of Romans introduced us to the reign, really, of sin and death. Um, I think chapter 5, we began to say, actually, yes, that's, that's being in Adam. That's Adam's realm. Uh, it's a realm that, in a sense, kicked off from when the fall happened, from when Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God and turned from God. And they, we, we, humans in Adam, fell from that relationship with God. The, the present evil age is the phrase that, that's used in the New Testament to describe that sort of bottom arrow that goes along the bottom there. This is Adam's realm. It's the present evil age. It's the place where sin reigns, if you like, and death reigns. Sin, as Romans again, 1 and 2 has, has made clear, it begins with, between us and God. That's, that's where sin ultimately resides. It's, it's our suppression of the truth about God. It's our rejection of God. It's our worshipping other gods, living for other things, creating our own gods and our own way of life. That's where sin starts, but it then spills over into every area of life, every facet of who we are as people. Sin, we've seen in Romans, controls us. We're slaves of sin. Ultimately, sin places ourself as God, and death results, physical death, spiritual death, cut off from God, eternal death, that f sort of future judgment that's coming. And the gap, if you like, along the blue line to the cross, if you could think of that as the, the Old Testament, and God, right from the word go, saying that this evil age will not continue forever. He is coming for the people that he has made. He will redeem them. He will buy them back. He will deal with sin. He will deal with death. This realm of Adam, if you like, will not continue forever. And the hints are there right through the Old Testament of how this is going to happen. And of course, when we get to the cross and Romans 3 and Romans 4, we see it spelt out what God has done. His king has been sent into the world. His Messiah has come. His son has come. He, is a sac he will be a sacrifice for our sin. He will pay in full the payment that sin deserves. Death will be taken by him. The righteous requirement of the law, as we've seen in Romans, again, a bit complicated at times, but ultimately the righteous requirement of God's law is that sin is met by a payment of death. And so Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, he keeps the righteous requirement of the law, he doesn't break the law, he, he's perfect in every way, and yet the requirement of the law that death should come to sinners, that death comes to him in our place. And so now we can be redeemed, we can be reconciled, we can be uh, put right with God and come into relationship with God. And Romans has hinted, chapter 5 has hinted about the, the hope of the glory of God. So we're now into that sort of oval, apparently, according to the PowerPoint software. That's an oval that you can insert at the end there. Romans says that, that we now have the hope of glory ahead. The, the, the kingdom that when it comes in all its fullness is described as the home of righteousness, where there will be no sin any longer. The paradise of God, the new creation, a new heavens, a new earth. No sin, no suffering, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. The wedding of the Lamb, Jesus and his bride in the home of righteousness forever. The hope of the glory of God. That's the kingdom, if you like, when it's come in all its fullness and sin and death are no more. But we're living in the shaded part. And this is where Romans, and much of what we've been seeing in recent weeks and what we'll see in chapter 8, really begins to speak into it. So we're living in the shaded part. Jesus said, the kingdom is here. 
The kingdom is near. The king has come. And so upon his death and resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to all of God's children, the new age, if you like, begins. The kingdom has arrived. It's been inaugurated. But we're not living in the times, as we've seen in Romans, where sin has gone. We all know that. Death is still with us. So the kingdom has come, and yet it is still to come in all its fullness, and we're living in the shaded zone. Now we can say, along with Romans, we're justified if we're Christians. If we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are justified. We are declared righteous now. But the word justified there is the end time verdict. We are justified, acquitted, not guilty. It's the end time verdict that's been pronounced now. So it's something of the future that we know is coming in, and yet we still struggle with sin. We have peace with God. We stand in his grace, and yet we suffer. Hinted at in chapter 5, and the whole of the rest of chapter 8, or the second half of chapter 8, we'll we'll grapple with that. We live in Christ, and yet we see, we know we're in Adam's realm. Sin is no longer, in chapter 6 and 7, sin is no longer our master as Christians, Yet we still sin. Swapping sin for righteousness is really difficult. I think most of us will agree. We're living in the shaded part. We sin is not our master. We're no longer slaves to sin. Romans has said that to us. If you've been here or listening in over the weeks, we're not under sin anymore. We're under grace, and yet we struggle with sin. And then we come to those verses that we looked at last time at the end of chapter, the section of chapter 8. Our body is subject to death still, and yet we're spiritually alive, and we have the promise of resurrection. So we're living in that zone. And the question before us this morning, in verses 12 to 17, is how do we go about life in the overlap of the ages where we're in Christ but Adam's realm is very much around us and still impacting us. How are we to live in February 2022? Well, in 12 to 17, if you just look down at that, and I think there may be another slide actually, um, which we can pop up. Um, Really, there's one great call to action in these verses. There's only one thing to remember. Um, Don't overdo the difficulty of Romans. There's one big thing for us to grab today in terms of a direction for living in the overlap of the ages. And there are at least three huge encouragements for us, assurances for us in this passage. So just look down at verses 12 and 13, and this will highlight really how we're to... to, one, One of the big things to go into this week in our minds is here in verses 12 to 13. How are we to live in this overlap? of the ages. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if we live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now, Paul doesn't sort of finish that sentence in verse 12. It's almost implied. He's been speaking about the the battle between our flesh or our sinful nature and the spirit who's in us for a number of verses now. So when he says in verse 12, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not for the flesh to live according to it. The implication is we have an obligation to live by the spirit. That's what we're to do. That's our direction of travel in that shaded area in in the overlap of the ages. We were born in the work of God's spirit. We are now in Christ and we are indwelt by Christ's spirit. So our obligation is to the spirit, not to the flesh. And again, to go back to that first diagram, the spirit has liberated us. He's united us to Jesus. He's applied the work of Jesus to our account. He indwells us. He governs our mind. He leads us towards life. He makes us spiritually alive even when we are in a decaying body. He graciously guarantees our physical resurrection from the dead, leading to a share in the glory of God. Our obligation, Christian, is to the spirit, not to the flesh. 
as is often the case here in Romans, Paul is often giving the, the sort of almost two choices. It's a binary issue as far as Paul is concerned. It's obligation to the flesh or obligation to the spirit. There are two destinations. The flesh leads to death. The spirit leads to life. And why this stark choice made me think about sort of options at school, that sort of year nine moment where you sort of come home. I remember coming home with a piece of paper and there's different like columns, A, B, C, D, and one from there, and one from there. And some choices for me as somebody who loves sport were obvious, you know, PE, extra PE. That was life to me. I'd like to take PE in every column, forget the rest. You know, PE or music or PE or drama or something, it was no contest, they're so different. Others were a bit more of a tricky contest. They were both dead to me, history or geography. He's spelling out for us here that the flesh is like an abuser, really. The flesh, the flesh just is, is, is bring, will bring you no good thing. The way of the flesh leads to death. It may be covered up as all sorts of things, or it may be presented as things that might be pleasurable or good for you, but the flesh, the way of the flesh, leads to death. Paul well, can't be any clearer. The way of the flesh is to remain in Adam. The way of the flesh is to remain with sin on the throne, to be a slave to sin, a master that will just lead you to death. The other way is to pledge your allegiance and your obligation to the spirit, a way that leads to life. The way of the spirit the call of the Spirit in verses 13 and 14, notice, is a call to arms. It's interesting, I found going through this this week, that actually the news, much of what you're about to hear in the next few minutes will echo what you're seeing a little bit on your screens and what's playing out. But it, that, we would have done this whether the news had been what it was or not. It's just the way it is. Verse 13, the obligation we have to the Spirit is a call to arms. Verse 13, if we live according to the flesh, if we leave our sinful nature in charge and live the way of the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The following verse says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So the children of God are led by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God leads us to put to death the misdeeds of the body. The spirit will lead the Christian to go to war against the sinful nature. Two things that come out of verse 13 is that this is an all-encompassing call and it's a radical call. We're led by the spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body. The misdeeds of the body are everything that is, belongs to, in Adam, everything that is not of God, everything that the sinful nature would have me do, everything that the flesh would lead me in. We're called to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Everything that is not of God is to go. And it's radical. It's a call to put those misdeeds to death, to be done with them, to... I don't want to put images of death in your mind, but to kill them off, get rid of them. This isn't the call to tidy your room. You know when you hear the call, when you, maybe you remember when you were younger, the call to tidy your room generally meant pick up your clothes off the floor, you know, hide any major offending items, generally hide anything you can in a cupboard or under the bed or something. This, that's not verse 13. Verse 13 isn't calling to, you know, for a little bit of tinkering in our lives as Christians. This, this, is a, this is a sort of throw wide your bedroom windows, put a skip at the bottom and chuck the whole lot out, get rid of it all, repaint, re-carpet, re-furniture. It's a complete radical change. The Spirit leads us, leads the children of God to put to death the misdeeds of the body, to clear all of Adam out and to put on Christ. And the early chapters of Romans sort of help us a little bit when you think, well, what are the misdeeds of the body? Go back and reread Romans 1 and 2. It's, 
It describes, doesn't it, life where God has been suppressed and got rid of and rejected. It's where God is substituted by other things, idols. We're made to worship. We're made to worship our maker. But having rejected our maker, there's a worship vacuum. We will worship other things. We don't go into neutral. We said all this back in chapters one and two. We will worship something. We will serve something. We will look to something to get what we would normally get from God. That's what happens in Adam. That's what sin does. Sin is now on the throne. It's me driving the car of my life as I see fit, according to my rules, my preferences, my desires, my idea of right and wrong. I treat others as I see fit. My well-being is actually paramount, uh, my needs over the needs of others. And that will express itself in a hundred thousand and one different ways. All of this is to go. All of this is to be put to death. All of those things are the pathway that leads to death. I was trying to, I thought literally this morning, and I didn't have time to look up where it was in Acts, but the, the moment isn't in the book of Acts where, this is stretching my memory now, where somebody was, was into some, some sort of magic thing and sorcery and things, and they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think, and I'm sure John and others can, can tell me at the end, I got, I, was there not a bonfire, if I remember that rightly? And all the stuff that was used in that old way of life, chucked into the bonfire, gone. That's what verse 13 is speaking about, that the Spirit of God leads the children of God in the shaded area, in the overlap of the ages, to put to death the misdeeds of the body, to chuck it all on the bonfire. The Spirit leads us in that way and empowers us in that way. You never find here in Romans or anywhere else, the call of the Spirit is never to a bit of religion. Never. It's never to a little bit of church going for good measure. It's never to do a little bit of good to counterbalance the bad. The call of the Spirit here is radical. It's a completely new ownership. It's complete change. It's seeing the things of Adam for what they are. They're godless and they lead to judgment and death. So now you're a new person in Christ. Now the Spirit indwells you. Now Christ is in you. Put these things off as the Spirit leads and as the Spirit enables. You can see, can't you, when you begin to sort of think about this, that this is speaking about a completely different life. It's the Spirit of God, if you like, on the throne, leading the way that we're going. And it will impact every facet of who we are. How we treat God primarily will change. That life it doesn't have a God slot. Life is God. It's knowing him. It's walking with him. It's being shaped by him. How we interact with people will be radically altered. How we speak, how we go about our time at work, how we use our money and our, the things that we have, what our morality is, our use of time, our ambitions, our hopes, our dreams, everything will change. I'm going to state the obvious now that that is not easy. It's an absolute battle. That go, we go back to, to chapter 7. Paul says it's a battle, it's a war. Sin is a master who does not want to let go of its territory. Sin is a master who doesn't want to let its captives, once captives, go. Our sinful nature will be with us until we die or until Christ returns. During the overlap of the ages, the sinful nature is very much there and will not let go. Sin will win some battles. We will fall. We will fail. The accuser will be as quick as you like to condemn us, to break us, to re-enslave us, to call us back, if you like, to live for the flesh and to bow the knee to the sinful nature. It's a hard fight. Again, it's a trivial example, but we've started playing badminton on a Friday now, and again, people that are around during between one and two on a Friday, I think are welcome to join us. Um, again, it's, it's, I haven't played for decades, so it feels like a battle. 
Um, I mentioned Richard Capaldi the other week, sort of flicking the shuttlecock here and there and doing the unimaginable. But we go in and we play two against two and, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you hit a spectacular shot, other times, as I did twice on Friday, a complete air shot, looks a right idiot. We fall, we fail, but we move on and we keep going. And this battle with the sinful nature is, is going to be like that. We will fall flat on our face. We will fall in the same hole again and again and again. It's exhausting. It's tough. It can be demoralizing. Our assurance as Christians can come very much under fire. In fact, when you start battling in this way, there are times when you think it would be easier not to fight, to lay down arms, to go sin way, sin's way. And that's where Paul is crystal clear. On the warning side here, remember that way leads to death. Sin does not have your best interests at heart. Sin is a master who would rejoice to see you and I, maybe it's my toggle, throwing in the towel. And that's where this call to war in the shaded zone is surrounded by assurance and help. On the one hand, don't lose sight of Romans 8, 1 to 11. You've been liberated. You've been united to Christ. Everything Jesus has done has been credited to your spiritual account in God's sight. The Spirit is in you. The Christ is in you. He's, he, would, he will govern your mind. He will lead you towards life and peace. He's made you alive even though you're aware of the struggle in your physical body. He's the one who promises resurrection. But, and don't lose heart, five minutes, there are three huge encouragements that come in verses um, 14 to 17. Firstly, Paul wants to see in verses 14 and 15, that you, Christian, have been adopted to full sonship. Full sonship. Verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Now, one of the things that are different in the new Bibles that you've got on the church Bibles is that where a Greek word essentially means Christian men and women, brothers and sisters, this new translation puts in brothers and sisters. So where, where it's all inclusive of the whole church, the language now in the NIV reflects that. But you'll notice here in verse 15 that they've left in the phrase about adoption to sonship. And they've chosen to stick with this word sonship. And if you've got a footnote uh, in, your, in your Bible, I'm not sure if it's there in, the, in these church Bibles, but my footnote says here that the Greek word for adoption to sonship is a term referring to the le full legal standing of an adopted male in Roman culture. So they've kept the word deliberately sonship because it's a word that's loaded with meaning in Rome. And what's being said in verse 15 is that an adopted child in Rome had the same legal standing and inheritance as a biological son. So uh, somebody who was not biologically of that family, who has been adopted into that family in Rome, has the same legal standing and inheritance as a biological son. And so what verse 15 is saying to the Roman Christians and the Redborn Christians is that God has has not adopted you to a new form of fearful slavery, but rather he has given you the full rights of sonship, just like Jesus himself, is what verse 15 is saying. Now, the, these things that are important that we grab hold of, two things here. Firstly, let that land that now as a Christian... But the Spirit of God has, has come into you and, and redeemed you and united you to Jesus, God has adopted you as his child and it, you have the same standing before God, the Father and the Judge of us all, the same standing now as the standing of Jesus Christ himself. 
And as we'll see in verse 17, your inheritance as a Christian is the same as the inheritance of, of, of the Son, Jesus Christ. So you see, while we're in the shaded area, while we're battling with sin and falling flat on our face and getting up again and it's hard work and we become demoralised, Paul, God, wants you to know this morning that the Spirit in you has adopted you and you stand with the same standing and the same inheritance as Jesus Christ. There's no difference. God is saying this. God is declaring this. And even though you may do a smash and completely miss the shuttlecock and end up flat on your face, you're still standing on a par with Jesus Christ and your inheritance is unshaken as his is unshaken. It's crucial that we, need, we know that because, as we said, the accuser, every time we fall down, will condemn, will question, will rob our assurance. The other thing not to miss in this verse is that you have not moved from one tyrannical, tyrannical master to another when you became a Christian. You've not moved from slavery to sin to a new form of slavery that is sort of just fearful. Am I going to match up? Am I going to be acceptable? Will God really take me? That sort of fear-induced following is, 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 is not the way it's to be. You have the same standing as, the, as Jesus Christ. The Father looks upon you in the way that he looks upon his Son. There's no difference between his adopted child and his one and only son. And those things are underlined as we move into verses 15 and 16. We have intimate access. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him, by the spirit, we, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We have the same, exact same access to the Father that Jesus had. And we find this Abba Father, as many of you will know, takes us directly to Gethsemane. Having broken bread and, and, and drunk wine and said, this is my body that will be given for you, this is my blood that will be shed for you, as Jesus will be arrested in a matter of moments and then ultimately taken to the cross. The very next day, Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, we're told, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, drip, dripping, sweating droplets of blood because he's in the heart of the battle. He's in the shaded area in that sense. And in his weakness, he falls down, doesn't he? And he prays the same words, Abba, Father, Aramaic, intimate, Abba. Some people say, don't they, Papa, Dada. It's, that, it's the intimacy of coming to the Father. And Paul says here that we approach the Father in exactly the same way. Our status, our inheritance, our adoption means that we come in the same way that Jesus came. We have the same access that Jesus had. And in that battle, in that shaded zone, in the overlap of the ages, the call is, yes, to put to death the misdeeds of the body. And the only way we can possibly do that and keep on doing that is to cry out, Abba, Father. Your will be done. Your will be done. And as we do that, as we put to death the misdeeds of the body, as we call out, Abba, Father, as we draw near to God as his children, we're told here the Spirit testifies and bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed God's children. We are being led on the way to life. And if we're in any doubt of our position before God while we're in the overlap of the ages, as sin buffets us and, and we struggle and we fall and we fail and we stand and we keep going, we run and we fight somewhere, if we're in any doubt of our position before God, verse 17 says, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The more we look to do what the Spirit's leading us into, in a sense, the harder 
things become. We become aware of suffering as we battle with sin. The suffering of another kind that's coming from verses 18 onwards. It's hard now, but it's glory then, says this final verse. As adopted children, we're heirs of God's kingdom. And we're at one of those moments, again, where I just think our brains cannot, we do not have the ability to comprehend what that means. We are heirs of God. We are heirs of God's kingdom. We are co-heirs with Christ, which makes sense, having seen what we've seen. We've been adopted, same status, same inheritance. We're co-heirs with Jesus. Everything the Father has prepared for the Son, and we're into our oval now at the other, on the other diagram, in the glory that's to come, Everything the Father has prepared for the Son, we are co-heirs of that inheritance. And then we just final thought, what have we done to deserve such riches? And the answer is nothing at all. This is the grace of God. It's undeserved, limitless kindness not only mercy and this is the difference isn't it between mercy and grace it's not only that god has been merciful and says i won't let's these musicians on the stage i'll I, I won't i'll be merciful to them i will hold back actually the judgment they deserve that's mercy to not bring the judgment that mike and marilyn and pierre deserve in front of him mercy says i won't treat you in the way you deserve grace says not only will I be merciful, but I will redeem you. I will, I will die for your sin. I will, I will pay the penalty that the law demands. I will bear the death that you deserve. I will place my spirit in you. I will liberate you from sin and death as your master. I will unite you to Jesus. I will work, do some sort of accounting miracle in that the righteousness that's in his account, I will apply to your account. I will put my spirit in you, in your, in your mind, to govern you and to lead you in a new way of life and peace. Even though you're struggling with death now, you're spiritually alive. And in fact, I will raise your bodies to live in my kingdom forever. You will have the hope of glory. You are in Christ. I will adopt you as my son and my daughter. I will give you a standing on a par with my son. Your inheritance will be his inheritance. You are an heir of the kingdom that I am building. Have you received this grace? If so, will you then fight sin? Will you put to death the misdeeds of the body? Have you received his spirit? Will you then follow him into battle this week? Radical battle. To fall on our knees and say, Father, what needs to go out the window? What has got to go? What is of Adam? Will you help me by your spirit? Give me the power to put on that which is in Christ. And one of the biggest mistakes I make in my life is to think that I can do that myself. And that I don't need to be utterly reliant upon him every single day and in every single situation. Life in the overlap of the ages is about radical transformation. It's about us growing God growing us to be the person that we will be in the oval at the end. Let's just uh, have a moment to pray, speak to God uh, ourselves about these things.